I just want to welcome uh, again, uh, Heather, who is latest book is Democracy Awakening. And in case you haven't read her Substack, which I doubt anyone in this room can say, Letters from an American, uh, the Substack link is in chat right now. And we're going to take the second right now to spotlight Heather too and bring her into the room and get going with our conversation. So. Thank you, Susan. And Heather will be spotlighted soon, sitting next to me, sort of virtually. And there, there she, she is. is. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for being here again. And I think she's muted. Someone needs to unmute Heather. I don't I don't know if I have that power. Do I? No, I don't. You ah. don't have the ultimate power. Somebody else did. Thank you Somebody very much for does. having me back. And it's lovely to see you, Celeste. Oh, thank you so much. And your book, is it pa paperbacks coming soon? Is that correct? In October. Yeah, but the, there's a secret. And that's that there's a new one I'm working on that is, I think people are going to like it. Now, I, if only I could get somebody else to write it for me, we'd be all set. Can you tell us anything about it? Not no. yet. Super secret. Okay. Yeah. You wrote a beautiful blurb on your friend Timothy Snyder's book on freedom that was very inspiring. So it's, it's, I just wanted to say, I, I suppose you two are, I know you're on the same page and I, I'm a great reader of, of your column every day, every night. And um, I believe On Tyranny from Timothy Snyder was one of the first books I purchases, purchased in 2007. And to Susan's point about um, she, she was telling me this a few days ago, even though she mentioned it, um, she goes to sleep feeling better. It helps her sleep reading um, letters uh, from an American. I think it's kind of like, it's almost like a CBD gummy in a way, I think for her. And lots of us certainly feel that way. And we were wondering, how does, how does Heather close off the the noise how, how do you i mean we see your pictures sometimes on the weekend of beautiful maine and i and i sound you're around such gorgeous nature but but how do you settle yourself down i mean so i don't close off the noise what the reason i think people find the letters comforting is because i look at all the noise and then i say that doesn't matter that doesn't matter i'm not interested in that here are the pieces that i need to have my feet under me and i'm as roiled as everybody else is until i write a letter and then i say there there's the day tied up in a neat little bow and i can push it aside now before i started writing the letters which take all my time of course you all know i love to to kayak and to i and to walk I don't get nearly as much exercise as I like to, but I'm actually a big baker and a knitter, uh, like things like that. And um, I haven't been able to do it for a long time, but that in in a, in a, the real world, again, I would be baking pretty much all the time. Okay. Well, I hope you have lots of time to do that after mm -hmm. November 5th. I really do. Uh, just, just a little aside here in our little town of Mill Valley, we're in um, the Bay Area, just north of San Francisco. Right now we have a community of knitters who have knitted around the, 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 um, barks of trees at yeah. the trunks of trees it's just such a it's such a cool thing is that something that that we'll we'd see in maine as well so i've never seen it here but that's a thing that's yeah. a, it, it actually didn't start in, in the united states but we've had a lot of it and people will have knitting parties and and knit bomb as it used to be called anyway over vans for example or fire hydrants or trees or whatever and it's it was originally designed philosophically as a way to soften the edges of some of the the inner city areas that felt like they had become too, uh, too hard edged. Wow, of course you would know the history of that. I mean, I just stand there in our time, town square and smile, you know? So actually, I, I'm gonna, gonna be really annoying here and be a college professor and tie this into what we are doing in this call. And that is that I knit because I, it reminds me of my mother and people like my mittens and my Christmas stockings, but knitting itself has always been very much a subversive activity. And in a number of war uh, of war times, people were the the occupiers, for example, would try to keep people from knitting because the number of stitches you put in something could do things like count troops, could tell you where things were, could count ammunition, and so that the idea of knitting as sort of homey is also there's a subversive side of it as well, and you saw that in things like. A Tale of Two Cities. Dickens is A Tale of Two Cities. When Madame Defarge is knitting and as she knits, she's doing something else, but I'm not going to say what it is in case people haven't read that. But so knitting, that sort of idea of doing something in your home that is going to change the outcome of the world, 
I love that because that's what a lot of us are doing here is, you know, sort of saying, okay, I've been involved in my community. I've been involved in those sorts of homey things like knitting, but it's time to take those skills out into the world and change this election. And, and I'm not, that's not a stretch. This is actually how I, well, I'm working on a new book. What can I say? <laughs> this is actually how I think about this. And we love you for that. And I love this idea of, I'll always think now of knitting as sort of coding. And it's it's something that I've wanted to take up. So now hearing your story is really incentivizing me to sign up for that class. So I, I have a question that's kind of tailored to our phone bankers, if you don't mind. I just would, you know, Kamala Harris was on Stephanie Rule's show last night uh, talking about <clears throat> her economic plan. And of course, you know, we can go through it and there's, you know, paragraphs worth of information. And, and, and this obviously is a question that comes up a lot of the time with our voters that we're talking to now, who many of them, you know, haven't had the time to really think about what they're going to do. They're maybe some of them are, I hate to say it, but we do describe them as low information voters, not quite as engaged as we are. And and so we are looking for the best messaging. Do you, do you have any advice to us about what we might what we might talk to our people on the phone, people who we talk to on the doors about it, and not just a slogan, obviously, because people want a little bit more. Well, so let me give you a very quick background, because one of the things you've seen a lot in the media is we want to know what her economic policies are. And the truth is she's going to continue Joe Biden's, and she ought to, because the United States economy is the best in the world right now. We've recovered from the pandemic faster than anybody else and all that. I could give you all the numbers, but they are spectacular. That being said, she has done three things. She said she's going to do three things. So what Biden did is he said, we're going to stop pushing money to the top of the economy. We're going to invest in ordinary people because that's what drives the economy. And the Republicans say the opposite. They think if you concentrate money at the top, those people will invest in the economy and it will lift all boats. And it's never happened that way. That has transferred $50 trillion from the bottom 90% to the top 1% between 1981 and 2021. That's not something, that's background that people need to know, I think. But what she has said is that she wants to continue to build an opportunity economy. And what she means by that is putting more money in people's pockets. So having the, the uh, child tax credit, for example, expanding the child, child tax credit, also um, making it easier to either borrow or to get a grant for a down payment on a house. And that's something that I suspect is going to come up a lot because that's the sort of thing that people go, oh my God, they're, you know, she's giving away free money. That's not at all what it is. And Forbes, which is a fairly conservative newspaper, has actually come out in favor of it. There are currently 1,500 plans in the United States to do something like this. What it says is that if you have good credit and all the things you need to get a mortgage, you can get either a grant under some things or a, a, a loan to borrow the 25 in her case $25,000 that you need to have a, a to get a down payment on a house. She has also talked and there's a lot of reasons you want people to have houses because of you know mortgages don't go up and rent does you build equity there's all sorts of things in that but also she has called for very simple things like having a national law against price gouging at the grocery store. So again, not a radical thing. The, a number of states have this, but if you look at the extraordinary inflation after the worst of the pandemic, that was caused by corporate greed. I mean, they had huge profits in that period. And in addition to that, she has called for, and this is kind of a no brainer to the point that even the Wall Street Journal, I believe, but in any case, a number of very conservative newspapers were you know, applauding this because it's actually sort of a Republican idea. When you start a new business right now, you can deduct $5,000 of your expenses, which is nothing if you're trying to start a new business. She's going to make that $50,000. And it, on average, it takes about $60,000 to start a new business. So she's saying, you know, we're going to give you a freebie in the first year, or you can actually amortize that over, I think it's a couple of years. So what she's really trying to do is to make it possible for families and individuals to free up cash so that they can join the economy and to build uh, uh, small businesses. And the reason for that is that small businesses actually drive the majority of our economy. I, we don't pay a lot of attention to it, but it's over 50% of our economy is small business. And if you think about that, you think, well, it kind of makes sense in the town or the community or the city you live in 
you, you, of course there are major corporations, but you know, there's the, the grocery store on the street corner. There's the babysitting um, cooperative. There's, there's all these different places where, which we would consider small businesses. So I think maybe that helps. And maybe also to recognize that the, the old fashioned Republicans, Bill Crystal, um, the Forbes, Mark Cuban, people like that are all saying this is absolutely straight down the center of Amer the American economy, whereas Trump is all over the freaking map. And among other things, his promise of these extraordinary tariffs are there is not an economist in the world who doesn't say that's going to send inflation through the roof. And he he doesn't understand how tariffs work. And, and uh, J.D. Vance tried to say, well, there's a debate over it. No, there isn't. There isn't a debate about how tariffs work. They are paid by the consumer, not by foreign countries. Nobody, nobody disagrees with that. That's economics 101. So I hope that helps a little bit. Just think Kamala Harris, small business and, and families and Trump I would say big business, but it's not even that. It's sort of it, his his policies are really what he thinks would be good for him. And I think is really feeding the idea of America first rather than an actual economy. I think you're right. Thank you for that. And I can I can see Susan furiously taking notes that we'll use for scripts for our phone bankers. That that, that is very helpful because because of course what we hear all the time is that you know people's deep stories, what their shared, what their lived experience is, and it's. Groceries, you know, are really expensive. So the whole idea of uh, greedflation, I think, is you know really important to, to talk about. And and this this whole tariff thing is so in interesting to to watch people expl everyone explain what it really means, and then to listen to Trump talk about it's sort of the 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 absolute alternative fact. You know, it's it's tariffs and speculative crypto investments. This this seems to be his his plan. So. I mean, we're working against that, which isn't much, but still. Anyway, tell well, us more. So in terms of phone ba banking, um, Senator Casey from Pennsylvania a year or two ago did a very simple, um, uh, it, it was a pamphlet, but it, we, online it looks like a, like, a, uh, it, like a slide deck. It's not, but you can read it online. It looks kind of that way. And he actually said, this is how much Huggies went up. He, he, I remember Huggies as being one of them, but he also talks about eggs. He talks about very basic things. And then this is the extraordinary profits the company made that year, the corporation made that year, because corporate profits were off the freaking charts. And that I th I found that very very powerful because I I'm with everybody else you know I can tell you all the statistics about how if you're in the bottom eighty percent your wage is actually increased uh, more than inflation did but it doesn't feel that way when you're in the grocery store and you pick up a box of Rice Krispies like I did the other day and I'm like holy heavens this is the cost of Rice Krispies you know even though you know maybe intellectually the economy is good and we're setting all these records in the stock market, it's like, how is puffed rice this expensive, <laughs> you know? So being able to say, well, in fact, the corporation that produced that turned around and gave this many billion dollars to its stockholders, that was a real eye-opener for me. Yeah, yeah. Lena Khan was talking about this. She used the word greedflation to talk about it on a 60 Minutes last week. And so were you just having cereal or Rice Krispie treats? I just, I have to know. <laughs> so um, I, I actually was was having cereal, but I, I can't even believe I'm admitting this to you people. I know I'm being recorded. You can melt chocolate chips and stir Rice Krispies into the chocolate chips and eat them that way instead of milk. And I'm not saying I did that, but I'm saying that it's a possibility. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and believe me, everyone on this call trusts you. So I, I have an idea about all what we'll be having for uh, dessert tonight. Um, a run on crispy, Rice Krispies at the local supermarket. So thank you for that. And uh, I, I really appreciate you giving us some, some good talking points that will whittle down for our phone bankers. So I wanna just pivot a little and get a little darker here for a minute. Michelle Goldberg from the New York Times, uh, she had a column last week um, where she was talking about the Dean of uh, UC Berkeley's law school. It's Erwin Chemerinsky, and he has a new book out about our constitution. And his, the new book, he's basically saying we're, this, our constitution kinda needs to be rewritten. It's, it's not, he doesn't see it holding. She had a kind of a different view. She didn't agree. She feels like our constitution made Trump possible 
And it's also the thing that's going to un be his undoing. And, you know, I think a lot of us feel helpless because of what we've lived through the past eight years, but also because of the Supreme Court decision and the immunity decision. And, and so I, I'm curious to know what, what you think about that. How do you I feel it's holding up? I have not read that book and I did not see that column. So I can't okay. comment on either of those things. I will tell right. you that when people talk about the left and the right in the United States, it always bothers me because in fact, the vast majority of Americans are in the middle and we are known as people who are liberals. And that doesn't mean you vote democratic. You might be a Republican or an independent who is a liberal. But what that means is that you believe that the government should protect the rights of individuals. And you have different ideas about how that should be. But within that concept of liberalism is also the concept of democracy or liberal democracy. And those of us who are there in the middle believe that the Constitution and the guardrails that we have put up around our liberal democracy are never perfect, but they are fixable. And you might disagree about what's wrong with it and how it should be fixed, but we like the basic tenets of democracy. Now, in this moment in which we're living, People on the right want to get rid of the Constitution because they don't believe in democracy. And, and that's happened in our past as well. But they literally say that because democracy requires that everybody be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in their government, that it destroys society because it means that LGBTQ plus people and women and people of color and immigrants all have to be treated as equal to white men. And that destroys the patriarchy, that destroys racial hierarchies, and that flies in the face for many of them of uh, their version of religion. So people on the right don't like the Constitution and a number of people on the left, which is not liberalism, the people people keep try, trying to divide those of us in the middle between right and left and we're really not. Um, on the left, on the right, you have people who want to destroy the, the Constitution and liberal democracy because they believe it destroys a society. On the left, you also have people who want to destroy that institution, those institutions because they believe they're so corrupted by sexism and racism, they can never be fixed. And one of the things that that it, it always bothers me when people say, oh, they're on the left or, oh, they're on the right, because the vast majority of Americans are actually liberals who believe in the Constitution, they don't agree about it all, they think it needs to be fixed and so on. So what I would say, having not, and I don't wanna talk about those things I haven't read, but I firmly believe that the rules of our liberal democracy need to be fixed for sure, but that we need to start with that base because in my observation of history, both in the United States and in other countries, when you tear down those guardrails of a democracy, Inevitably, what you end up with is a strong man, an authoritarian system, either from the left or from the right, and that destroys the rights that people in the middle have. So I, you know, I look at where we are and I think we have made the mistake of believing that our guardrails were strong enough to hold. And and not everybody felt that way. You know, people like me have had our hair on fire for quite a while now. I still believe that the American people are ultimately the drivers of this engine and that we can make these changes. We have in the past. We got the 14th Amendment, which was a game changer. So I expect that we will see another series of major um, uh amendments to the Constitution, reinforcements of guardrails, overturning of Citizens United, overturning of Donald Trump versus the United States, getting rid of the pieces that have made us, uh, you know, real in real danger of getting an authoritarian government. If we continue to work together, all of us in that vast middle and to say, wait a minute, let's protect our system here the way it ought to have been protected all along. Well, I keep re I've read a number of, you know, dark articles about it, but and Michelle Goldberg in this column essentially comes to the same conclusion that you do. And Applebaum, who has been kind of a, an expert, um, Autocracy Inc., her thin little book that really dives deep into the business of autocracy across the world. Ultimately, she was, she was quite hopeful at the end for the reasons that you state that we're, we're going to come together. But, you know, democracy does, it feels like, and I think that there's some evidence that it's backsliding across the globe. And, you know, I'm not sure what it is. Do, is it just we live in this chaos, chaotic, connected world, and it's obviously more easily easy to connect it because of, you know, the, the virtual online world that we live in? And is it just easier to convince people that authoritarianism offers more stability and democracy is just a big 
it's a it's a big mess. I, I well, what is it that what is the appeal? Well, the the I think the appeal for first of all, I don't think there is a huge appeal for strong men. I, I really don't think there is. The reason we got into the mess we're in is with the end of the Cold War, people made the mistake of thinking that democracy was going to win and everybody was just everything was going to be hunky dory. We were going to lift people out of poverty, which did happen, by the way, more than a billion people got lifted out of poverty, especially in Asia. And there was going to be wider human rights and there was never going to be war anymore and everything was just going to be terrific, right, going forward. But at least in the United States and in the UK, we made the mistake of thinking that capitalism and democracy went hand in hand. And what in fact happened was in the former Soviet republics and in other places as well, as uh, dictators began, like Vladimir Putin, began to concentrate wealth in their own hands. They wanted to store it somewhere else, and they stored it in places like the UK and in the United States. And as they did that, they supported politicians who would um, you know, sort of erode the guardrails of democracy so that they didn't have to put money into social welfare systems, for example, because they didn't want to put their money into things like that. And where we ended up was eventually with the concentration of wealth and power in a very few hands, especially in places like Russia, although that this is that's a very limited way, of course, to look right now at everything that's going on. But for our purposes, they began to exercise something called virtual politics or political technology in which they managed to flood the United States and, and the UK as well in 2015, 2016, um, with uh, messages to tear the United States apart and to tear Europe apart with the idea that if in fact you got rid of NATO, you got rid of the United States as a world leader, you got rid of Europe holding together, that people like Vladimir Putin would be able to put together this imperial Russia that he had so dreamed of. And what and it worked certainly in uh, in Britain and in the United States to some degree. That's what gave us Donald Trump. But that being said, one of the really interesting things about this moment and one of the reasons that it was possible, I think, is because since 1960, Americans had really stopped to talk about democracy and how important it was. And one of the things that you noticed during the first impeachment trial for Donald Trump in 2019 was people beginning to talk about democracy, especially Alexander. Alexander Vindman, who, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's Alexander, I'm not Eugene, um, Alexander Vindman, who said, um, you know, here right matters. And he was talking about democracy and more and more people were talking about democracy. And so I think people are now once again, recognizing how important that is and recognizing that people are dying for their rights around the world and that we ought to protect ours. But one of the things that is so interesting for me in this moment, as somebody who studies ideas and historical change is that I just described to you how political technology managed to undermine democracy by flooding the zone with so much stuff, people sort of backed away and said, I don't care, I'm not going to be involved, or by flooding us with disinformation that convinced people of stuff that wasn't true, or by running candidates with fake names or with names that imitated you know, uh, an opponent's name so that the vote got split. Somebody just went to prison for that this week. Um, you know, there, there are all these methods that they used. But one of the things that is really interesting is in a way what we are doing is an experiment to see what happens when the American people recognize that this has been done to them, what do they do? Do they turn around and say, oh, I don't care, this is, you know, I, I hate everybody? Or do they use those same tools to wake up and protect their democracy? And one of the things that I think is, I think that is exactly what's going on. I think all of us would probably not have been here 10 years ago. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting today is if you if you watched Donald Trump held what was theoretically a press conference ish kind of thing, but it was really I kept putting on on X that it was um, the September 10th debate 2.0 because it was just a rage fest. But one of the things that I thought was so interesting is he kept essentially appealing to Vladimir Putin, essentially sort of saying, please help me, you know. Uh, Vladimir Putin or Russia, if you're listening, is what it sounded like to me. And I thought people aren't picking it up this time around. You know, this time around, he's he's really sort of begging for help, it sounds like. And and certainly we know Russia has tried to help. They, they put at least $10 million into tenant media in Tennessee. But I'm just not sure people are buying it any longer. They're saying, wait a minute, we really care about democracy. So although democracy has been backsliding for a number of years around the world, we're also waking up. And I don't think the past is necessarily in any 
uh, any predictor of what's going to happen going forward. Um, I, you know, there's a, there's, a, I've been reading some articles and, and I heard a podcast about it. I think it was Ezra Klein talking about uh, the gathering storm of angry young white men who have been, um, well, they, they were identified a while back uh, by Steve Bannon, of course, who's been sort of courting them and romancing or bromancing them for all these years. And then he found the perfect candidate for it. And I, and I, and I guess I, since Title IX, you know, women have made such tremendous gains and men have been slipping, right? They, women, I think, are more likely to buy their first home before men are. We're, we're doing better in school. There are more of us graduating from school. And so, I mean, it's wonderful for women, but uh, men are, I think, it, it, it seems to me they're young men are sliding. And they're, something I read recently where they're gravitating towards churches, mega churches now, and going in and finding some solace there where women are more likely to say, they're leaving, you know, organized religion. So this this group seems to be, uh, you know, who Trump, I think, and 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 MAGA are are courting. And I, you know, I, personally, I worry about them and and what that means for us. And I, you know, I suppose they're unreachable and not the people that we're trying to convert to vote for Kamala Harris. But they they they're becoming a bit of a force that you know keeps me up a little bit at night. Yes, and I, I don't think we're going to reach them before this election, although uh, one of the things that Josh uh, Shapiro did very quickly after he took office in Pennsylvania, and one of the things that Biden has worked hard to do is to, um, and Harris says as well, is to make very good jobs available to people who do not have college degrees. And that that was an attempt in part to take the fangs out of this argument that they, which was actually constructed by Pat Buchanan under Richard Nixon's administration, are looking down on you because you don't have a college education. This is designed to say, no, you don't actually need a college education. You need these skills and we'll make sure you get these skills. So there was that, which I think is a very positive development. But I also think there's something really interesting about Tim Walls, and that is that if you think about the way that Reagan rose and the I, the the link between the idea of the individual American who is you know a gun owner and is going to defend his women and you know he's fighting back against a socialist federal government and you see this in places like Waco and Ruby Ridge and Red Dawn and that whole sort of you know, take my gun in my hand and I'm going to defend my family sort of ideology. That was always a myth. That cowboy ideology was always a myth. And one of and, and it has made a group of young men two generations in not good partners. They're not good community workers. They're not good, you know, they're having trouble with their personal relationships and their families. And one of the things about Tim Walls is he's the opposite of that. He's that that dad kind of figure. And one of the things that I think will be really interesting, you know, where he defends his family and he says, I love you to my sons and or to his son and, and his daughter and so on. And it's going to be interesting to see if by putting aside the the Trump, we can actually recover what is a much more normal uh, and expected role for men in society. And one of the things I think is really interesting, and I will be writing about this soon, is after the last mass shooting, a number of people said, oh, you know, the Republicans are in bed with the NRA. Well, they certainly were in, in, in the past between about 1980 and about 2017, but the NRA is bankrupt. And so why are the Republicans still insisting on everybody and his brother having a gun and having a bump stock and having all these extraordinary weapons of war on our streets? And I had an interesting conversation with Shannon Watts the other day in which she said, if, you know, I thought, well, you know, they're afraid of their their base. And she said, yeah, somewhat. But more than that, guns are now a point of entry for the Republican Party. It's a way to groom young people, young boys, to get them into the Republican Party. And that's something I think that we need to take seriously. But I also think that that's a link that could pretty easily be broken in a number of ways. And I am not a legislator, but, you know, among other things, you could just send the cost of uh, ammunition through the roof. You wouldn't even have to deal with guns. Ammunition is very, very expensive and you could make it more so. I mean, there are plenty of ways that we could try to break that connection. And I think it is so important to do that. Yeah, I think breaking that cycle means 
so much to, I would consider everyone in this call probably feels the same way. Many of us are members of Moms Demand Action and have been so, you know, in awe of the work that Shannon did over the years. In fact, there was a gun violence um, conference today that uh, President uh, Biden and uh, VP Harris were there making an announcement about some of the actions that they're taking. Obviously, what would they want most of all to begin with is to, to ban assault weapons. But yeah, we need these men. And I think Tim, I think you're right about Tim Walls, his welcoming, um, open, empathic, uh, you know, sort of way of presenting himself is, is, is that man that we all, we all cherish and, 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 you know, he, he's, he's a great model. And I, you know, you were talking about Mark Cuban. I think he's a terrific surrogate for, for the campaign and someone that men can look up to. So that's all good news. You mentioned Ruby Ridge, and I was reading an, an article a few days ago about um, abortion care or uh, the lack of abortion care in Idaho. And it's so I, I'd like to talk about abortion a little bit here and just reproductive rights in general. And of course, this Tony Marino and the horrible comment he made about, I mean, the good thing about the comment that women over 50 don't care about reproductive uh, freedom is that it pisses off a lot of us. And of course, we care deeply about it because guess what? We all still go to the gynecologist, even if we're not having babies anymore. So I, I think that, um, but but this situation in states like Idaho is terrible. There's a there's an exodus of, of doctors uh, right now, and women can't get the health care that they need. And so I'm, I'm hoping that, um, I'm just hoping that this is, a, this is one of the campaign issues, along with the economy, that's going to motivate not just young women, but women and, and men everywhere, like Sam Elliott said in the that Lincoln commercial, the, the commercial he did for the Lincoln Project, right? Be a man, vote for a woman, vote for the woman. So how, how are you seeing things? As you, I know you've been traveling across the country. Are, are you feeling that people are just enraged about what was taken away with the Dobbs decision? Yes, there's a lot going on with that. So of course, women are enraged at having lost a constitutional right. That's never happened before in our history. But Marino's comment was insulting on a number of levels because of course the whole idea of abortion rights has been pushed by men. So the idea that somehow older women shouldn't be involved, they should defer to men, um, was just bizarre on the, you know, on the grounds that, you know, older women can't have children anymore. So instead they should defer to men. That was sort of a, a slap in the face to the entire, um, the, the entire opposition to the, the anti-abortion movement. It was just a weird thing to say. And I think spoke to the reality that the anti-abortion movement actually begins before Roe v. Wade, and it begins as an employ in uh, in 1972 for Nixon to try and pick up Catholic Democrats because he's afraid he's going to lose the 1972 election. And when he does that, the initial um, push against abortion, which had been really been been um, legalized in a number of states in the late 1960s and early 1970s was because of the extraordinary numbers of women who were dying um, from uh, from botched abortions. And it was initially, it initially came not from the second wave of the civil rights movement, of the women's civil rights movement, but from doctors who said, women are dying in huge numbers here. We must stop this. And the backlash was not about protecting unborn children the way it, it morphed in the 1990s. It was about making sure women did not have the right to, to have abortions. It was about women's rights. It was about stopping women's liberation. Phyllis Schlafly comes out, big conservative woman comes out early and says, you know, we have to stop these women's libbers. And she has a whole thing, a series of things that we have to stop the women's libbers from doing. And then she says, and they want abortions so that they don't have to work at home. They don't have to stay inside the house. That's all she says about abortion. Now, one of the things that's, and I think you have to look at these laws as being an attack on women. And one of the things that's really interesting about the whole landscape since Dobbs is certainly women are taking this as an attack on women. But one of the things that the anti-abortion movement did very successfully was they convinced a number of people that abortion was about sort of, you know, uh, career people who were getting pregnant and not wanting babies. 
And they really, that was, that was never true. And, and, you know, the pro rights side always said, no, it's about women's health. And what we've really seen since the Dobbs decision is the recognition that this is not about women's selfishness. It's about families protecting the health of the people in them. So it is not a women's issue any longer. It's the issue of, you know, uh, a child like that poor child in Georgia whose mother died. You know, it's an issue of husbands who want their wives to survive a pregnancy and or a miscarriage and not to bleed out on the, you know, on the bathroom floors, which is, which happened recently. And in, in I think it was Texas. Um, it's a it's a it's a very different way of talking about abortion and it it i think is one of the reasons it has become salient across not only women but also men who are of reproductive age or fathers who look at their daughters even if they're in an older group and say I don't want to lose my child because she can't get to an OBGYN or if she does, an OBGYN won't take care of her when she's losing a baby. And that's, I think, maybe something important or an important way to frame it for people who say, um, you know, I don't I don't believe in abortion. Well, maybe you actually do. And similarly, uh, without exceptions for rape or incest. That's something that people don't like either. And the other piece on that that I think is really important, it, it, this is in the Republican platform. And a lot of newspapers said it wasn't, that this was wrong, but that's because they didn't understand the language. In the Republican platform, you can go look at it. It says that they want to protect the rights of uh, unborn, I don't know what the word is that they use, from um, under the right, the 14th Amendment rights from the time of conception. And what that means, that's called a personhood law. And what that means is from the time an egg is fertilized, it has the same rights as any person does under the 14th Amendment. And what that means is that a mother is no more important than that fertilized egg. And that's a huge deal because that says no abortion. That says no kinds of many kinds of contraception. That says no IVF. That says that that fertilized egg and onward has the same rights as a human walking around on the streets. And that is that is so radical that when people started talking about it in um, in the early 2000s, it was considered a crazy fringe idea, way beyond what any sort of very, very religious person on the right would think. And now it is literally in the Republican platform. And that's worth pointing out to people because a lot of people are missing that. I, I certainly appreciate that. The personhood thing is such a big deal. And uh, this, uh, there are some that actually believe, you know, the mother isn't an, as important at all to the growing fetus. So it's, I still think it's crazy and fringe and, and, and that's great. And I, I feel like we're using up your time and I, I know that you want to write. So Susan Bowley, did you have something that you wanted to um well, I, I I really appreciate that you took so much time with us, Heather, and yeah. you haven't had dinner, and I know that that's also probably affecting you. So uh, I I we have a couple of questions, but I you know it's I know we kind of uh, right at the time that we we planned on that you would depart and go write the letter. So uh, do you want to take a question or? You think if, if you would like to, I'd be happy to. I, what I what I the reason I'm here yeah. is because of you all. And because of everything you're doing, and to the degree that I can help that, I'm happy to do it. Thank yeah, you guys, so much. You guys are the real heroes on the front line here. And, and I'd also like to point out, you know, we talk about the fear. This is also a time of extraordinary hope. This is not an election you want to sit, sit out. You want to be able to say, yeah, in the election of 2024, by God, I phone banked. I was exhausted. But you know what? I put, I gave my all and look, we changed the direction of the American society. And that's what I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing. But you people are really on the front lines. So thank you for what you're doing. And sure, Susan, throw me a question. I'll throw you a question. Okay. Um, so what the economy keeps coming up in our calls, every conversation we have with a voter. And it just, the president doesn't set the price of grocery or gas prices. How can we help people see that they can, and, and refocus on what Harris can do versus Trump for people and their financial health. It's just, we, we are having a really hard time breaking through to a lot of people. So 
in part because the press has really not covered how fabulous the economy is. And I know that really kind of gets in the weeds. Trump is really Trump believes that if you concentrate wealth at the top of society, the rich people will invest well in the economy and we will all do well. But between 1981 and 2021, um, $50 trillion came out of the pockets of the bottom 90% in America and went to the top 1%. Mm -hmm. And now he wants to do that again. He wants to have more tax cuts. And all the tax cuts do, tax cuts for the wealthy and for the, um, the people at the, uh, for the wealthy and for corporations. Harris, in contrast, wants to make sure people in the, in the middle and to some degree at the bottom have access to money because they buy stuff and they will then expand the economy. And that's worked. The, the economic growth rate in the United States is higher now uh, under, under Biden and Harris, despite the, the even counting the fact they came in in the midst of a depression or a recession, higher than it was under Trump before the pandemic. So this system works. And of course, Trump ran the, the deficit through the roof. I mean, he tripled the national debt. It's the highest, um, the highest uh, uh, increase in the debt aside from wartime in our history. So um, I, what I see is people saying things like, I don't want to give away $25,000 for someone to, for a down payment on a house. And that's important to say that that's actually not the way it works. It's a loan or it's, um, it's a grant that's covered elsewhere. Or what about inflation? And one of the things that that um, that the the Trump people say is that big corporations are always good because that gives you an economy of scale. And what that means, of course, is that you get monopolies that charge whatever they want. And you can see this quite literally in things like um, Microsoft or, or all the big corporations. But you can also see it in things like the fact like junk fees. You know, and that always jumps out to me when you buy a ticket at Ticketmaster and all of a sudden it's like 150 bucks for them to print it or whatever it is. Or when you go to rent a car and you have rented the car for like 80 bucks a day and then you get there and there's all these other fees. The Biden administration has done their best to get rid of that. Republican Trump um, judges keep stopping those in the courts, but of course we can keep fighting that. And the other thing that, that Harris has said she will do and that, that Lena Khan started under Trump, and this was a huge deal, I'm sorry, under Biden, and this was a huge deal, was that rather than saying you can we can consolidate all these corporations and that'll be good for people, she said, no, we need competition. And so what they're trying to do is pull these big organizations, these big corporations apart and say, no, you can't, for example, have the largest grocery merger in our history, which would give control of most of the groceries in America to one corporation. Um, the problem, I think, is that the economy is complicated. So if you say, you know, she wants more competition, more help for small businesses and more help for regular people. Maybe that helps, but the, the problem is if you're really gonna do it, gonna take on the economy, it's pretty complicated and hard to have some sound bites. Um, whereas Trump just says, I'm gonna have tariffs and that's complete bullshit, I'm sorry, but it sounds so easy. We'll just put up a wall and everything will be great. Well, that's why he says other people will pay for it. We pay for that and it will. there's not an economist in the world who won't say that that's gonna send inflation through the freaking roof. They they came out with charts today that said, you know, you're looking at 9 to 11% inflation under under those plans. Well, but he's done such a great job of attacking the media for, you know, the past 10 years that uh, he's created this this kind of, you know, environment of mistrust of anything that an expert says. So, um, but I, I feel like we're making some inroads. Susan, is there another question that oh, came yeah. up on the no? I think I think Heather's been so generous with her time. You have. And uh, I really want to thank you always for visiting us and for all, all the work that you're doing uh, on the sides to motivate all of us and inspire all of us and, and what for what you just said, because it's true. Everyone has to stand up right now, get off the sidelines. We really need your help to contact millions of voters who keep saying they want to, they don't really know Kamala. They want to hear more about her, her which is very frustrating to us. But we, we're, we're making sure they get to know Kamala and, and the Harris Walls administration's plans. So thank you, Heather. Um, let's go. You were going to finish off with something? 
I was just going to thank you all once again. I, you know, again, I'm so thrilled to be part of this community and I'm doing my part and I'm, you guys are here because you're doing your, your part. And we got, I, I, what did you say? 39 days? We have 39, um, days. 39 days. I the feel like we're in, over. I feel like we're in high noon, you know, where they count down the minutes in that movie where it's, it's in real time. We're like in our own high noon and, and it's our time to, to make our mark on the world. And I think we're doing it. Uh, because we're doing things like this. So thank you for what you're doing. I am going to go right. And uh, and good luck to you all. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Everybody, let's give a round of applause for our favorite historian. Thank, thank you, Heather. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, and, every, thank you, everybody. Thank you. thank you. Good night. Take care.